prime example of Phil Carpathet in Canada, how he is taking his staff in a very practical and efficient way uh, through the Clarity ISAs, and how he is implementing them also in a way that he still can earn an appropriate living. Jim, anything? Anything you would like to say? Is that? Yeah. So now you remember the answer. Yes. Is, huh? Right. Uh, uh, is there any more question? We can. We have time for only one more. So please keep it short. If there's none, that is very good. There is. Okay. Uh, uh. Okay. Uh, I'm Farooq Rahman. Uh, one of the revised standard is auditing estimates, uh, and uh, I think one of the most revised standard is this this one. So uh, there are a number of new requirements uh, in, in that revised standard. So when these requirements put to practice, how do you see the auditors will come out and how will be the documentation for that? Like, is there any assessment or any expectation that, uh, you know, although all the requirements have to be complied with, but, you know, they're quite complex requirements. So how do you see, like, these, this standard being put to practice and what will be the results? I didn't get precisely which standards you were talking about. Estimates. Accounting estimates. Yeah. Um, <coughs> but thank you for that question because this is a very important issue. Uh, accounting estimates, fair values, etc. Um, and precisely because it is indeed complex, we have now also um, issued that exposure draft of auditing complex financial instruments because it's for many it's new um, I've done it myself in large treasuries and of course in the banks it's it's difficult it's complex it's changing all the time um, and it is very much in this gray area of all kinds of assumptions and uncertainties um, so this is a standard where I would agree with you that it's a rather complex one and the other thing I can say it's because the subject matter, the issues are very complex in practice and many would say that has the profession dealt appropriately and sufficiently with in particular the area of estimates and fair values. Um, and at least that's why we thought having an educational document, which again is a lengthy one, for those that have to deal with these issues, in particular in the financial instruments area, um, is very important. So here indeed you only can say the reality is that we have to deal with this complex environment and these complex issues. So if you are an auditor that has this type of clients and this type of issues, yeah, you better be well prepared. There's no way out. Just a very small, very short comment, I said, because they have to catch a flight at half past ten. <laughs> okay. So, these points were raised, and there's so many people here. Uh, just would like for you, because you are the chairman of the technical uh, professional advisory committee of the institute, you know, and this is coming from Jim's uh, presentation, uh, the slides on code of ethics. I just talked to you about it. That. As far as the Code of Corporate Governance, uh, which is applicable now, is concerned in Pakistan, it talks about IFAC Code of Ethics. It doesn't talk about ICAP Code of Ethics. So we may be in a situation that by January 1, 2011, the new code, which has not been you know, approved by the council or issued, you know, may become applicable by, you know, due to that uh, issue. And perhaps the institute needs to take it up with the with the SECP when this revision is taking place, because I am sure the intention of the institute and profession is not to you know uh, that the new code becomes applicable without the approval of the council. That's that's number one. The other point that I would like you to consider is this issue of you see historically in Pakistan uh, the ISAs once adopted. We have never re-adopted it when, whenever there were changes or amendments. And this is what uh, the members understand. And my understanding and most of the members' understanding is that by December 15, the revised ISAs, including the group audits, uh, uh, you know, becomes applicable by 
you know, for the periods ending 15th December. Obviously, all the major firms, six largest firms being uh, members of the forum of firms, they're already implementing those uh, standards, so uh, the, the revised right. uh, standards. Clarified ISAs are the same, they're just clarified, so the revised standards have, are also required to be implemented. I just heard this morning from the President and from you that it seems that it is not the intention of the Institute to make these you know, revisions mandatory from the time that the IAASB intends it to be. So if that is the case, and that may be a genuine reason for doing it because of the significant changes uh, which are there, in that case I think perhaps the communications have not gone uh, to the members, uh, you know, at least. Uh, I may have omitted it, but so there is a need to urgently communicate right. on these matters. So well, I just wanted to highlight this. Okay. As far as your second question is concerned, this matter has been under discussion between some members of the council and a clarification will be issued after being considered in the PSTAC that will be done very soon. And your first question was regarding the code of corporate governance. Of course, that is a matter that you can also take up in the next meeting of the PSTAC, right? With that, Professor Anand, it's very nice of you to have been here. And uh, Jim, and we conclude the session and we continue with the rest of the rest of the activities for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to call upon the President of ICAP, Mr. Sakir Masood, to kindly come on stage to present on behalf of the Institute as memento to our two speakers. <laughs> um, I would like to request Chairman IASB, Ms. Professor Arnold Schroeder, to please come up on stage to receive the memento. to request the executive director, Mr. James Hiff, to please come forward. Thank you, sir. I would now like to request the Vice President, sir, Mr. Zayed Bal Bhatti, to please come forward for his closing remarks. Thank you. Professor Arnold Schindler, Mr. James Philp, Mr. James Silf, rather, Mr. President, gentlemen past presidents, and it is very nice to see all of you here, or rather most of you here, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Council of the Institute, I would like to thank all of you for gracing this occasion. The three days visit of our honorable guest, two days for Mr. Jim, himself is a part of the Institute's ongoing efforts to provide for its members a better understanding of emerging challenges in the accounting and the auditing professions, as well as to strengthen coordination with international bodies through networking and providing a forum for interaction between our members and the, and the visitors from overseas. To ensure proper financial reporting and its examination in accordance with internationally recognized standards, ICAP is cognizant of the need to be fully compliant with the IFRSs and ISAs as these are issued. As a matter of policy, ICAP does consider the recommendation of each new IFRS for notification by the SCCP and also considers the adoption of each new ISA as these are issued. As a result, most of the IFRSs 
have been notified by the SSCP upon the recommendation of ICAP.